everyone. It is time to head north. I'm Natasha Ryan, your co-host of our lovely podcast alongside of me, Vincent Rocco Vargas. And Vince is a former retired, how do I say this, Army Ranger? Because, I mean, you've still got the skills, Vince, clearly. Yeah, I am. I guess former is the right word. Matt would probably know, right? <laughs> 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 and Matt and you go way back. So why don't you introduce Matt, Vince? You're muted, buddy. Sorry, I had to change my headset. Yeah, so me and Matt go back to, you know, the, the Ranger history. I was in the combatives instructor back in 2005, and this is where I learned Matt's, Matt's name. Uh, and he's part of the history of the United States Army Combatives Program. And we furthered our relationship as I advanced in through, through the combatives courses and started to continue to learn and grow. Me and Matt became connected. Uh, and eventually, when I went to Homeland Security, I asked for his assistance in help developing a program for combatives and weapons retention for law enforcement, or essentially the Special Operations Community of Department of Homeland Security Border Patrol. And we ran several courses with it. Eventually, Homeland Security was a little uh, uncomfortable with the fact of potential injuries. But even though we ran three courses, well over 30 guys uh, certified and no one was injured, um, you know, the, the Homeland Security didn't move forward with that program. But Matt is a well-versed person in the Ranger community, in the combative community, and currently, uh, you know, works with all kinds of different different organizations in that aspect. Matt, how you doing? I'm well, brother. Good to hear from I, you. I mean, I didn't even mention, you know, published author and all the other things that are going on in your life. But, Lots um, of accolades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's a long list of them, longer than mine, you know what I mean? I'm trying to catch up to you. <laughs> But Matt, I wanted to bring you on here to talk kind of about like what's going on in, in kind of in our country now currently, um, what we like to, to kind of talk about in people's expertise when it comes to safety mitigation and risk management. Um, recently, we've had some issues with a lot of active shooter situations and knowing that you are in the world of understanding that. And, and I love your ideologies about this. You know, I'd love to hear, you know, kind of your thoughts on what's going on currently in the in the space of that and as well as personal safety. OK, well, so I should a couple more things I should tell, say about my background to um, for the audience there. So I'm I'm currently the director of hand to hand combat training for West Point. So all the cadets have to go through my training and I and, um, you know, from the very close to the first day they get there, they have a whole bunch of touches on um, four years of training. I'm also. Um, I'm an evolutionary psychologist and I specialize, I think I'm the only one in the field that specializes in the evolutionary psychology of combat. Almost everybody in that field is about boy girl issues, but that's not really my thing. So, so this is, um, so those, those things play into, and, and also when I was in the, in the contracting world, and this is where, you know, whenever you were working for Homeland Security, this is, uh, my other area of expertise is how do you develop how do you change the culture within an organization? Um, and as primarily the tool that I've been using over the years is uh, is combatives training to help do that. But you can imagine, uh, you know, for example, whenever the army was deployed for the first Gulf War back in the early 90s, the, the 24th Infantry Division at the time had almost 600 people go AWOL rather than show up to deploy. And that's almost an infantry battalion worth of people in one division. So the, the problem was cultural as in, all those people came in the army for some reasons and those reasons didn't jive with actually going to war as a soldier. And so therefore, so how do you kind of fix those problems? So the reason I mentioned that story, wow. Yeah. Wow. The I yeah. Is, yeah. The reason I mentioned that is because, you know, these are cultural issues that we're having, you know what I mean? This, this whole mass shooter thing and, and um, you know, how our society is becoming, you know, you know, violent crime is, is uh, on the rise. And, and those are all cultural issues and that any sort of answer we're going to have to them is going to be a cultural answer. So, so that's what I, I would, you know, first people of character seek the truth. And the truth is we have a cultural problem and we need to address it like at that level if the solutions we're going to have are meaningful. Hope that makes sense. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, I love that. Search the truth. Um, I have so many questions, so I'm just going to jump in here. Uh, first of all, 
I, my dad went to the Air Force Academy, so thank you for your service. Um, I know you're at West Point, but, you know, <laughs> all military. Um, my question is, you know, I grew up in a household that was very service oriented. You serve mm -hmm. the greater good. You protect and serve the country first and foremost, right? And when I think of like the, the kids that you interact with, these kids that are enthusiastic and coming through West Point, I mean, I just want to get the overtone on how you feel um, younger kids in the country are thinking. And is it harder to recruit them to serve the greater good now? Are they inherently more selfish as a whole? Or are you seeing that next generation that wants to step up and be the protectors. Yeah, I would say, well, from the West Point perspective, you know, we get exceptionally good students and they yeah. are, and the, the, you know, the mission of the military academy is to provide the army with warrior leaders of character. And so our entire approach is how do you at the same time educate them on various things, you know, they need becoming an engineer, et cetera, but right. also, while you're at that and still in them character. And so that's a, you know, like I said, I think we're doing a really good job of it because we get good raw material and we've got a hundred, couple of hundred years of experience on how exactly to do that. And we're, we're also tapped into, you know, all the, 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 the best we can be in the academic world. So all the best literature, et cetera, you know, we have a whole program, it's called the West Point Leadership Development a program that is about that. How do you take somebody from, and, and when you have four years, a little over four years to, to be able to, to inculcate in them a sense of duty and, and uh, yeah. what it means to be a person of character. So, so I, I think we have a, you know, as a nation, right, we have a couple of things going on. Number one, we are still producing those people. And, okay. and, that's good to know, right? Because good to hear. Yes. Yeah. And when you when you think about the 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 academy, the Air Force Academy, is saying, when was the last time you heard some big controversy that involved somebody who was a graduate of one of those institutions? It's, it's not really a thing, right? Right. Because yeah. because we produce solid people, we recruit good people, we have a good program, we produce solid people, and I mean people of character, you know. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is what's going on as a nation. Now there, we have other problems. And we are certainly, pardon me a second, we are certainly, um, um, we have some room, we have some issues there. Uh, I just, I just was writing something about today, you know, we have this, this idea that everyone should be treated with respect. And, and I, I completely disagree with that. I, I would say that, you know, respect is something you earn. Now, everyone should be treated with courtesy. You know, everybody should be treated with politeness. And there's, there's no reason to be a rude person, but right. those things are not the same thing as treating somebody with respect. You know, respect is you respect somebody who's not a liar. If they are a liar, you don't respect them. We don't respect thieves. We don't respect grifters. We don't respect, you know, we don't respect people who are not product productive. You know, we don't respect people who are people of low character. Yeah, and it, and the the way, reason we've gotten there is is a little bit, you know, it's a it's it's not on purpose, but we've gotten there because we're trying to fix other problems. Imagine if school teachers, you know, they they tell your children, you know, treat everyone with respect, but they're trying to get rid of things like bullying, and so right. that's that's a valiant effort, right? You you don't want right. the kid who's just got you know born with unruly hair or doesn't have the latest tennis shoes or something like that to be the victim of the, of, you know, childhood cruelty and, and children are cruel so that that's going to happen. You have to have a way to address it and to stop it. But what's happened now is we've, we've taught them the wrong idea about what respect means. You know, respect is, 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 it is not the same thing as courtesy, you know, and it's not the same thing as being nice. Whenever what you need to teach those children is to be nice to each other and being nice to each other. That's the same thing as like, if I meet somebody that I don't know, who's a, you know, whatever else is going on in their life, whatever sort of person they are, however they're presenting me, that doesn't matter at all. How am I going to treat them? Well, I'm going to be as nice as I can be to them. Right. I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to get along because civility 
is a method of of avoiding violence <laughs> you know yeah. so I'm, I'm gonna be as nice as i can to him because that's the proper thing to do you know my my father taught me that being a gentleman you know the definition of a gentleman is someone who who tries to make the people around them more comfortable and so that's that's the approach i'm going to take and it doesn't matter to me what's going on with them. that doesn't mean i'm going to have respect for them i don't even know them i don't right. know if they're a liar i don't know if they're a cheat i don't know if in the conversation we're having they're trying to take advantage of me. Yeah. And so I'm going to feel all that stuff out. And then I'm going to make my judgments on whether or not they should be respected in the conversation. Does that make sense? Yeah. Respect and kindness are not yeah. interchangeable. Do you feel like social media is probably the one big tool that has kind of hurt the patriotism in America and also what is, I mean, it seems to be like, so in the active shooter sense, a lot of, they're disgruntled teenagers to for the most part right there's something to that effect they're alienating themselves from the communities they're the unpopular at the moment for whatever reason there's there's social uh like distance distance from the the, the average crowd or whatever you want to say is, is is the cool crowd or whatnot um but it seems that social media has almost created a world for that right a space that yeah. is you know and and almost and and then our our the way we approach active shooters, and I only see I'm using the active shooter term, but it's like as a whole, there's there's this issue that it kind of I feel like it gets almost uh, multiplied through social media in the way social media is used, right? Let's highlight the person who did the bad thing. Like, well, you just gave notoriety to someone that probably right. didn't deserve it, right? Or maybe they were looking for attention, so they did. And we've done all these studies recently, and we're seeing all these kind of little nuances between you know the characteristics of them. And, and, you know, and then and then you have the other side of there's the defender who that recently a 22 year old kid who had a gun on him, you know, yeah. was able to defend, mm -hmm. and, which in my eyes is a great thing. And then you have the opposite side saying, well, it was illegal to carry. And so, you know, and it's so these escalated mm -hmm. conversations turn into, um, yeah. you know, I think there's a bunch of things going on here. And and yeah. so I, it's it's difficult to address them all, but I'll, I'll try to take a, a stab. OK, so first thing I would say is that we have. Um, we have a, a, a rise in tribalism and it's probably exacerbated by social media. And, and what I mean by tribalism is this, right? Every human being forms their in-groups and out-groups. So, so just imagine, um, you know, we, we are a species, this is, I'm going to come to the evolutionary psychology of this, right? So there, we are a species that, that forms groups in order to dominate resources, just like wolves and chimpanzees. And there's some other species that do the same thing, right? Or similar sort of thing. And so that's like wolves fighting over the valley, right? And we have features as a, as a species that, that form closer groups like that. And one of those features is our sense of morality. And so our sense of morality, it's, a, it's imagine, uh, imagine that, um, it's evolved in part from our disgust mechanism. So here's what I mean by that. Like if you, if you take a food into your mouth, that is, that is um, maybe going to be poisonous. It, it, it's probably going to be disgusting and you might, your body's just going to exp expel it. Right. And that same mechanism happens when you eat foreign foods. Like if, you know, I'm not Scottish. So if I eat haggis, right, it's probably going to be like disgusting to me and, or something like that. So, so that, that same portion of your brain lights up for moral disgust and moral disgust is equally about foreigners. So for example, one time when I was in Afghanistan, I had a meeting with this uh, warlord that was in the control this Valley and I was trying to get some people through it. And the whole time the meeting was going on, he was petting this little boy, you know, and I knew what was going on. And I, of course I was repelled by, it. I was disgusted by it, but he thought that was completely normal and so did all the people in his circle and you know that was a normal thing in the the culture that he was a part of so the reason it was disgusting to me was because it's foreign right so it's yeah. not my morals it's his morals and so what, what we have going on in, in whenever you see people talking about morality either way right what they're always what they're actually talking about is in group and out group so morals work in two ways the first way is people signal their moral purity, so you know, their, their virtue signaling, right? That's why half the comments on Facebook or Twitter or something like that is somebody proclaiming the righteousness of their side of whatever it happens to be. This is the moral 
position. What they're really doing is signaling in-group loyalty to whatever group shares those morals, right? You can you can see that on the abortion debate. Both people are self-righteous in their in their pronouncement of the morality of their cause, right? So right. it's either, and so so that's that's one thing that's going on. That's one way that it works. And the other way it works is through shame. And shame is enforced loyalty to whatever. You want to be part of this group, you got to believe this, right? So what happens, what's happening with social media is we have these different moral systems that are, that are hitting each other. And everybody's going through all these things of signaling which side of the moral debate they're on and shaming others. Look, if you want to be on this side, you must believe X, and so that's the, the dynamic that's going on, right? And it just happens to be happening like on a national and global scale because of social media. You know, so, so, you know, the, probably the answer to that is first thing is understanding what's going on because we have, because we could form our in-groups however we like, you know, like uh, I got in trouble for this and I'll go ahead and do it again because I'm, 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 I'm that guy. <laughs> but, but I got, you know, if, if you, once you explain that we could just decide what, how are we going to form our in groups and people do them in a whole bunch of different ways. You know, some, by, some, in, some in groups are like the simple ones, uh, you know, are like a sports team in groups, you know, these are cowboy fans and these are Steelers fans, right? Those, yeah. are, those are in groups, right? And they have different levels of loyalty uh, based upon what your commitment to those groups are, you know, I'm, I'm from Texas. So that's an in group. I, we're Texans. Right. So, so, some people form their morality. I mean, like I said, we get to choose what's important to us and how we form our in-groups. Mm. Okay, so uh, the, you see in the country, that's, you know, some people are liberals, some people are conservatives. Mm -hmm. Those are in-groups that people have decided to, to adhere to, and then they do all that stuff I was talking about to, to make themselves, you know, a part of it, right? Some people choose that stuff on, on uh, you know, like their nationality. So we call those people nationalists, right? Some people do it with their race. We call those people racists. You know, if you form your in-group based upon something, right, whatever it happens to be, um, that's a self-identifying feature of you as a person. You're like this, right? So, so you know, like a lot of the answer to this stuff is education. It's like, okay, how are we, how are we doing that? What's going on? Let's understand the dynamic of why we're at each other's throats. Yeah. And so try to rise above that stuff so we can say, okay, right. well, you know, look, I, I form my in-group full of people who want me in their in-group. You know right. what I mean? You don't got to be part of my in-group, except me. Right. If you don't right. accept me, well then, yeah. why, it, it, why am I going to accept you, right? <laughs> and it, you know it's interesting you, you say that, like, I have a 19-year-old daughter and we seem to butt heads on every topic there is that we that you can fight over and we fought recently over we fought we had a, a heated debate over uh the wall in immigration and she's like yeah. why would we do that and i was like hold up and she was more angry but yeah. what i told her i said you shouldn't be so upset about this you should be able to articulate the emotions by just telling me what your side of the debate was yeah. and then i can tell you on my side what mine was but it turned to a heated thing because in the past several years of her being in high school and college, she's had to debate her opinion in this very aggressive manner to get her voice across. And yeah. I was like amazed by it. I was like, hold up. We don't have to fight to, to communicate. Yeah. You know, and it's, and, and we've had to learn this as, as a father daughter now, who's uh, actively thinking and actively in the moment of educating herself yeah. on these topics, not fully invested in, but learning. She feels that she has the grasp on some of the topics that she, might not as well as I do. And so she comes at me with aggression. Right. <laughs> like, well, so, wait, so let me tell you what's going on there. Okay. So, so. Um, Dr. Matt. Right, so, well, I'm not a doctor, but I'm a, I'm a PhD student. So I'm close. Right? <laughs> you're close. Anyway, but, but I would say this, like, so whenever you're, the difference between a discussion and an argument is what part of your brain is engaged and what your goal is. Okay. So when you're in a discussion, your prefrontal cortex is engaged. Your intelligence is engaged. And the, your goal is to learn something, right? Like when I'm talking to you, I'm listening to what you have to say because I'm under the assumption that you might know something that I don't know. And therefore, I want to hear what you have to say, right? Like I'm taking it in and I'm like, hmm, considering it, you know? And what happens in a discussion is shared intelligence, right? Like, like 
if you and I are discussing something, we are both smarter because we're both keying off of each other's brains so that we can get more ideas going, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so that's an important idea. But when you have an argument, an argument is not about that anymore. An argument is about social status. So what I mean by that is the as soon as it's an argument, the the brain activity stops being in the prefrontal cortex and it goes down to your hypothalamus, right? Your root brain. And that is about who is above who, right? So when every, so in every human relationship, right? You know, father, son, spouses, etc. there's this sort of relationship going on. Somebody's this one and somebody's that one. Right. <laughs> and, and so the things that key anger are the, like, this one starts to do this. <laughs> this one's going to be upset, right? If this one starts to do this, this one's going to be upset, right? So that's what's happening whenever anger is, in, is in, it gets involved and becomes an argument is you're no longer trying to learn anything. Yeah. What you're trying to do is establish your position re in relation to the other person. Right? I imagine, Matt, if she was 250 pounds, she'd want to she'd want to establish dominance by actually fighting. Right. Too much. <laughs> there, are various, there are various methods, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> But you see what I mean? But that's what's going on, right? So so what they should be teaching them in college is that very thing. Like, we're going to have a discussion in here. And if you're upset, you've already lost the argument because you've disengaged your prefrontal cortex. Everybody in the room can see you losing control of your intelligence, no longer operating out of that function anymore. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a better way to go at it. So, so, you know, I mean, that's when you're having that discussion with your spouse, right, or with your child or with your colleagues or with your whatnot, you, you know, that's a, that's a general rule. Like come at it from the perspective of I'm trying to learn what you might know about this. And if you can control your, you know, status defense mechanisms, then they're more likely to, too. And, and then you're more likely to be able to learn something from the discussion. And, you know, that's, if, if it's a discussion, that should be your goal anyway right like that's right. the whole reason we're talking to them is to maybe maybe they know something you don't know either yeah. that or you're trying to like check it out that's <laughs> <laughs> right. so valuable to know because i mean what we have what we see on social media i mean that's all across the board is that some people won't take the time to actually educate themselves on topics they will they will support because they chose that side of the argument and they will push as facts instead of like well, let me read more on this. Yeah. And that's that's a very valuable tool. I think it came from the, the wide influx of mass information all at once. We have not yet learned to really dissect information and really kind of come to terms like, oh, there's multiple mm -hmm. different opinions on every subject. Let me see where I fit in. But more so, I'll take the broad spectrum answer and run with this as facts. And yeah. that becomes issue, it, you know, problematic. Yeah. I can't stand that as a former journalist. I can't stand it. I mean, nothing. I always come back to this and complain that nothing is fact checked anymore. And, you know, that you can find a narrative to fit any opinion. And you can find a set of facts because, yes, you know, yes. it's like, uh, like one of the things to remember is a lot of the people involved in this, you know, like especially in politics, all those people are lawyers, right? And so, you know, they actually teach, you know, the, Lawyers, one one kind of lawyer is be an advocate. And when you're an advocate, what you do is you take all the facts that are at your disposal and you try to downplay the ones that don't favor your cause and upplay the ones that do favor your cause. It's a sophisticated form of lying, right? They don't lie. They just favor the, the, the facts of their case, right? And so yeah. that's that... Uh, so lawyers are trained to write like that, right? So, <laughs> so, so that's actually what people are doing is they're... You know, they're ignoring as much as they can the facts that don't go the way. And look, we have really good research on this. We know that people do that. You know, it's it's, yeah. it's a confirmation bias. Well, right? I do that sometimes. Right. Of course, we all, we all do, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and you can't yeah. even avoid it, right? Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. we, we can't do it. We we see a fact that bolsters a, a pre-existing opinion and we like the fact and then we want to show it to people. We see one that isn't and we don't like it and we try to downplay it and ignore it. And, we might not, we're, and we're not doing it consciously. It's not like a right. evil in, you know, malicious, yeah. right. It's just the way humans are. Right. So, so cool. let's talk about, you know, getting rid of this because what's sad to me is I feel like there are so many younger 
people in the country that are so desperate to be part of a group and a tribe that maybe they're not even being authentic to themselves because they're now like adapting, you know, I mean, adopting all of these viewpoints and, and, and running mm -hmm. with it because it gives them a sense of identity and self and look at me, I'm part of X, Y, Z, whatever group, whether it's political, whatever. Um, so you say the key is education, which I feel like the key is always education, but what does that look like to you? Like map that out for me. Like what does a course, what does well, a lesson, what does that look like? Yeah. So, so, uh, I mean, let me just come back step. So there's a, one of the key players in the developmental psychology is a guy named Keegan. It's one of the, um, uh, and he like laid out the developmental steps that, that uh, people go through as adults, as opposed to a yeah. PhD who was all about children. Right. So, so imagine that, you know, you start by, at a certain level in your development, you, you're uh, social. And and what I mean by this, like we're everybody's always down on teenagers because they're susceptible to peer pressure. But developmentally, what they're actually learning at that point in their life is how to fit in with groups. So, of course, they're susceptible to peer pressure. That's the definable nature of what it means to be an adolescent. Right. Yeah. And so so you know, first off, we should understand that. And we should just know that that's what's going on with teens whenever they're going through all this stuff and they're falling into all these things. And, and, you know, we should, we should know that we can, that, that, that you're not going to be able to fight that. What you can do is figure out ways to make sure that the, the groups that they might be able to fall into are positive groups. Right? Yeah. So, so that's an important thing to note. And, and we also should note like, like, you know, Look, this is kind of a bigger, bigger picture thing, but just, just imagine what really, what really is going on, like on a larger scale, as we become more and more sophisticated society. Okay, um, there was a social scientist hundred years ago that came up with the idea of rationalization. So, rational, the, the theory of rationalization is that as we, as we become a more rational society, that means all the smart people are currently are constantly trying to figure out better ways to make society more efficient. OK, and we say that all the time. Look at all that's going on in the ways we transfer money, the ways we communicate, we blah, 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 yeah. all these things going on. Right. OK, so as those things are happening, what's really happening is the smarter group of people in our society are the ones figuring all those things out. OK, so imagine who makes the laws, who figures out the communication platforms, who makes all that. It's smart people. Right. So the so the smart people are making all those laws and all those all those ways and all these all the niches and how you can make a living and whatnot. And so, so, you know, I think it was uh, Thomas Sowell who said, <laughs> imagine how dumb the average person is, right? And, and appreciate that half of people are dumber than that. Okay, so, so we have a lot of people who are just unable to function in this more and more complicated society that we're building, right? Yeah. So. So, uh, so at, what do we do with those people? Wow. Yeah. What, what do we do with these people? Right. Well, here's what we actually do. You know, what we do is we warehouse them because eventually they're going to screw up because they can't fit in. They can't get along and they can't blah, blah, blah. And when they do, we snatch them up and then we warehouse them. Right. That's why there's a rising number of people in prison, et cetera, yeah. because yeah. society is more and more complicated, you know? And it's like, whenever you see all the violence going on, okay, so where's the violence going on? The violence is mostly in small pockets, right? Yeah. Okay. So, so imagine this, right? And this is not just our society. This is every society. When you have a when you have a, a, a large group of people who have no possible way, and we're specifically talking about boys, right? Because young men are competing so that they can gain some social status because women select men based upon their social status so they are competing to be able to find ways to gain social status right so what ways do we give young men who are born into the lower castes of society okay they can be a, a, a athlete of some sort right yep. and you can, that's one way that we can do it or they can or they can be a, or they can forego status for a very long time in order to for sure have it later that's the we're what we're, you know, here's the good advice, be a good student. And da, 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 da. what we're really saying is be a dork all the way until you're in your mid twenties. And then you're going to get all the girls you want. That's what we're really saying. Right. Okay. So, okay. So then the other option we give them is be violent. And that works now. 
All you got to do is get on, you know, the radio channels and listen to the music that the kids listen to. And it's always about that, right? Here's the kid who's the pop, 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 pop. Okay. That guy, the gangster guy, that, 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 that guy gets the girls. Now they're selecting for that guy because he can get status. That's why the people are really violent in the, you know, like in the, those pockets we were talking about, because if you've got nothing in life, right? All you got is your reputation as a tough guy, man, you're willing to go to violence now. And that's why people who have high social status don't, they're not violent because they have a lot to lose, right? Yeah. No, you're not, you're not getting a whole bunch of shootouts going on in the upper class societies, right? That's because everybody's got a lot to lose. And so everybody's, ooh, it's down at the bottom where nobody's got anything except their reputation. That's where the violence is. That's why it's like this. Guy. That's why the dissing culture, you know, you diss somebody, you, you know, show them a lack of respect. Bam, man, you're going to get violence right straight away. That's what it's about. So, so what are the paths that these kids have? Right. That's why once I just laid out, okay. They try to be athletes. That works for a few of them. Not too many, you know, then you want to be a dork until your mid twenties and just do without. That's a bad path, right? You know? Yeah. So, so, so that's the thing. And then like, look, these, these, um, these mass shooters, they're, they're similar. They're status seeking in the ways that they can, you know, mm -hmm. all these guys are like no father having incels, right? That, that's mm -hmm. what's going on with these guys. They're just the sort of people yeah. who who are outcast, you know, and they keep track. You know, that's why, like for said, we don't want to talk about these guys. We don't we, if we were as smart as a society, we wouldn't even cover that stuff in the news because if we stopped having it, yes, in the news, stop saying their names, stop or that the event it. happened, or that the event happened, right? If yeah. it never got publicized that somebody was doing that stuff, it would die tomorrow. There would be no more incidents, right? That'd be the end of it because they're doing it for the notoriety. You know, they keep if you look, there's a web page, escapes me what the name it is, right? There's a web page where you can look at all the social media posts from all, all these um all these mass yeah. shooters and they all they all like uh hero worship the columbine shooters right and if you go look back at what those they they talk about it like it's a video game man they're gonna get a bigger count they're gonna da, 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 right they are all like trying to get social status somehow you know but but look we don't want to talk about that because man the first amendment is sacred it's the second amendment we want to attack right See what I mean? Like, so all the people who are in the business of of selling soap by getting you to pay attention to their their show, right? Those people are the ones who are like largely controlling what we do as a society. You know, what I mean? that's it's true though, right? Like, this like, is a this took a turn I was not expecting today. I mean, this is just, about we, combatives and belts, and now I'm like the, all the psychology with it is fascinating. <laughs> Yeah, Pandora's box. There's so much more. We, we we're gonna have to do a a part two on this, Matt. We I'm do. Gonna, hey, I love to talk. Hey, and and we you know we I know we'll, we'll talk this like next time. But let me let me go ahead and you know just yeah wrap this up. The reason we started to come around is we're gonna talk about the the combative belt system that we're working on now. So we we gonna talk about it last time, but but just, let me just tie it into what we're doing. Yeah, please. What we're talking about. So okay, so I'm creating a belt system for combatives. It's not about it's not about, you know, here's the techniques you must memorize like martial arts systems are. It's actually about culture. It's about how do we how do we raise a culture full of people who are going to be virtuous people and who are so, you know, and I know, you know, Vince, we've talked a lot about the whole like PTSD and, and all that kind of stuff before. OK, so so there's a there's an important thing to note, right? That one of the things we're finding out about PTSD is, is that most of it is not actually what we thought it was. So just imagine human beings have been at war since the dawn of time in our natural state where we're at war constantly. And in fact, if you look at the, the rates of conspecific death, we've, we've shown from, for, from forensic, um, uh, anthropology, we've shown that the rates from death from conspecific violence, which means humans killing other humans, is very similar to the rates between wolves and killing each other and chimpanzees killing each other, which are approaches, which are in those species, the number one causes of death, right? And the same was, it, was the true of humans in our natural state. Okay, so if that's true, then how is it traumatic? 
you know, because is war more horrible now than it was back then? If you look at the way wolves and chimpanzees fight each other, man, they have they beat each other to death and eviscerate each other and then they eat each other. Okay, so it's it's always war's always been horrible. It's always been the worst thing, and it's the natural state of man. Okay, so then how come all of a sudden it messes us all up? Okay, so the answer is that we have evolved over time as we became civilization that smaller and smaller percentage of our society are, are warriors. You know what I mean? So, and we gain our, our morality, you know, our, our sense of right and wrong, our deeply held beliefs from the people in our lives who are, you know, mine is a good example, the regular people. My dad's an electrician. My mom's a nurse. You know, my, I went, had a school teachers, Sunday school teachers, preachers, Boy Scout leaders, all the regular people that, influence your your moral development okay and what we found is that mostly what happens with ptsd is what's called moral injuries and the moral injury is when a deeply held belief is destroyed by events things that you do things that you see etc okay i'll give you a, a great example of this okay imagine your whole life told that it was a terrible thing to kill a child right Okay, so then the guys in when they were in the Somalia fight, which I was not part of, but the guys in the Somalia fight, one of the things that happened was the bad guys hid behind women and children. And pretty soon, if they're shooting at you from underneath a woman's and a child's you know, armpit, you're either going to die or you're going to shoot them. And now you've got to live with this forever that you did this thing that you've always been taught was this horrible thing, right? Okay, so the problem is that you have to have a morality. You have to have a sense of, of morality that can handle this and allow you to be able to be a productive, normal citizen, right? Raise children, hold down a job, be a good person and a warrior because war is war and it's horrible, right? And then everybody who's been to war knows it's horrible, right? Okay. So does that destroy you? How do we build strong, resilient people, right? How do we build them? Well, we build a warrior ethos. We build a morality within ourselves that can handle that, that can be able to be the warrior you need to be to, and at the same time, the citizen, you know, and that's, that's the belt system is about that. And, and it's not just about that, but there's, there's more to yeah. it, but there it's a, it's the whole idea is how do we make ourselves stronger? As a nation. Now, just you mentioned that kid, the 22 year old with a pistol going into that. Compare that to the hundred cops in Uvalde, right? Okay, so look, the bulls of the herd protect the herd, right? Not just the bulls, the strong cows do too. And that's why they have horns, right? Okay, so that's our role. Our role, all of us, is to be the bulls of the herd. Okay, and to tie it in even more, you know, when the number one time that people have issues with suicide and whatnot is, especially we're talking about soldiers and, and servicemen and whatnot, it's when they retire. Yeah. Because when you're a soldier, it gives you a sense of mission, a sense of purpose. Duty, right. Have something you're doing. Okay. Then what happens when you retire? Well, most of us have this big, like, issue figuring out who we're going to be. Yeah. You know, I, I went to Iraq, you know, four days after retiring from the army as a contractor, man, because who am I? Well, I'm a warrior, right? That's what I am. Okay. So, so how do we how do we fix that problem? Well, we give people a sense of mission. You know, yeah. hey, train, be the warrior in the room. Being the warrior in the room means that everybody around you is safer because you're there. Right? Love you're it. a fighter, you're a good shot, you know trauma medicine. You, you know, if you train yourself to be that, you're that 22-year-old with that pistol who stopped that shooter. You're what every one of those cops in Uvalde should have been. You're the person that makes everybody around you safer. And it gives you a purpose and it gives you a meaning and it gives you something to train for, right? Yeah, that's what it's about. So next time we'll talk about that, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I, I can I'm talk for belted. hours. I, I know, I'm going to get belted. I want to, we got to talk about that offline, Matt. I want hey, to man, no, no, listen. So you're you're already on the road because, because uh, so the, the belt system is not about it's not about memorize these techniques. It's about accomplish these goals. So one last thing on this, and you know, imagine this, like what was chivalry, the real chivalry in the old days of knights and whatnot? What was it actually about? Well, it wasn't about 
courtesy and how men treat women and all that stuff. That stuff all came from like the 19th century, trying to like normalize it and, and give it to everybody, right? Who are mostly peaceful people in our society. Okay, what chivalry actually was, was how you got rich and famous in an era when everybody were mounted warriors. Let me think of what the word means, chivalry, right? It's cheval is horse, right? It's like, uh, what, what is it? What is uh, uh, in Italian, it's uh, cavallaro, right? In the Spanish, it's uh, uh, caballero, right? So, so yeah. it's the chivalry means the way of the mounted warrior. That's what it means. Okay, so what was the way? The way was how you got notoriety. And how did you get notoriety? If you look at the source materials, it's like, okay, you fight, right? And there was various levels that you could fight at. So you fight in tournaments and the joust, you fight in local wars, you fight in foreign wars, you fight in blah, blah, blah. And as you took on larger and larger things, you got more and more notoriety. And what did you do with this notoriety? Well, rich people gave you land in exchange for fighting for them. That's what, that's what the whole, you know, uh, feudalism was, right? It was like, oh, okay, I'm going to give you this much land and you're going to fight for me. That's what it was, right? And they did that. They got that to be rich and famous because some rich guy thought they were a badass. Okay, so the belt system is about that. It's about how do you prove you're a badass? Here's how you do it. You win fights. You win shooting contests. You freaking blah, 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 blah. You go down the list. And that's what the belt system is. It's a way to document that you're a badass. Can you put that on your LinkedIn, Vince? Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, no, I'm gonna work on this. Badass. I'm telling you, man. And <laughs> look, who are who are our poster boys, right? Look, there's a, we have a list of, of our black belts. There's 22 black belts right now. We're about to promote a bunch of others because these are guys who've been working on this stuff for years. Look, it's guys like Tim Kennedy, right? Yeah. Who, who is who would you like to have on your side as somebody of note in America right now if you were in a fight? Well, that's one of the guys, right? Yeah. Like no matter what was happening, you'd want that guy. You know who else you'd want? Vince Vargas, right? That's who you'd want because I know what you've done in your life. <laughs> Thank you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. You've proven again and again. And that's what the system is. How do you prove to your fellow warriors? Because the board, the belt system, like it's not for me, right? It's not, I don't promote people. The board of black belts promote people. It's basically like a way to, to create a, a resume of your warrior accomplishments. And if your resume is, you know, it's, and it's judged by the people who've gone before you who are already well-known badasses, right? Yeah. And it's judged and that they're, and it's like a guild. You want to be part of this group? Here's what you got to do. Love Love it. It. Yeah. We have to call it. We're at our time, but we are having you back. All right. Good to talk to you guys. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so we will get back to you. And of course, go to TNGdefense.com for more videos, podcasts, just like this. If you don't want to watch, you got iTunes, Spotify, Podbean. Thank you, everyone. Thanks again, Matt. And we will see you soon. See you soon. Later.